This episode is one of a series in which we investigate the manifold ways in which people in the Middle East have attempted to control and utilise water over the course of history. My name is Dr Ed Hayes and I work as part of a team of researchers on the project Source of Life, Water Management in the Pre-Modern Middle East at Radboud University in the Netherlands. Today we'll be looking at the water supply of medieval Baghdad, the great city on the banks of the Tigris. We will learn how integral water was to the life of the city, from drinking water to water taxis, floating bridges and a teakwood canal to the Caliph's palace. I will be talking to Dr Hugh Kennedy and Dr Josephine van den Bent. Hugh Kennedy is Professor of Arabic at SOAS in the University of London and from 2022 he has been teaching in the History Department at University College London. Josephine van den Bent is my colleague on the Source of Life project at Radboud University and Assistant Professor of Medieval History at the University of Amsterdam. A very warm welcome to both of you. Thank you. So I'm going to start with Josephine. Please could you just give us some basic information about medieval Baghdad? Uh, when was it founded and what was its layout? Yeah, so medieval Baghdad was founded in 762 um, of the Common Era. It was founded by the Caliph El Mansur. And he founded it in a place where there was a bunch of waterways connected to Euphrates to the Tigris. Um, and one of the reasons he does found it there is exactly because of the presence of those waterways. And there's a couple of small existing villages there, but nothing major. And that is where he builds his city. He starts by building um, what we know as the round city, a circular or perhaps oval um, structure with four gates. Um, and that is where he builds his palace and um, the congregational mosque in the middle. And that is actually on the west bank of the Tigris. Um, but fairly soon, the city starts spreading. Um, the markets are moved outside of the Rant city to uh, the neighborhood called al -Karg. Um So there's a whole city that sort of builds up around that Rant city and then also actually on the east bank um, of the river. So the city comes to straddle the Tigris River, um, the two parts, the two sides are connected by, um, by bridges, pontoon bridges. Um, and through that city on both sides run various canals. Um, thank you. And Hugh, maybe you could just um, help us zoom out a little bit. And what, what do we know about um, the sort of ecology, the geographical features of, of the broader region um, in which Baghdad was located? Well, Baghdad is located in an area that I think I like to refer to as Greater Mesopotamia, which includes a lot of the Jazeera area of modern Syria, right up to the great bend of the Euphrates, where the Euphrates goes closest to the Mediterranean, and right down to the headwaters of the Gulf, but also includes the area of Khuzestan, now of course the province of Iran, which has actually the same, uh, very much the same geographical characteristics and the same uh, riverine characteristics that we find in, in Iraqi Mesopotamia. So it's, uh, that's why I call it Greater Mesopotamia. Now Baghdad, exists and, and flourished because it is at the junction basically of two important river systems. The first and most obvious one is the river systems of the Tigris and the Euphrates and their tributaries. As Josephine's just been saying, uh, the Baghdad is on the Tigris, it straddles the Tigris, uh, but it was in the times when Baghdad reached its apogee, as it were, its highest population, uh, it was connected to by a series of canals which flowed from the Euphrates to the Tigris. The Euphrates is run slightly higher uh, than the, the Tigris, so there's a gradient which takes the, enables the water to flow from the, the Euphrates across to the Tigris. And these canals, these, these connecting canals, were very important for the, um, the transport of goods. But the other important river system is of course the river systems that connect Baghdad with the headwaters of the Gulf and so on. Now, these two river systems have very different characteristics. Both Tigris and Euphrates flow strongly. They have strong currents. They're very difficult in lots of ways to navigate except in very small but shallow draft boats and so on. The connection with the Gulf is very different. The, 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 the gradient is much less so it's possible to move goods upstream 
so to speak, as well as downstream. Carrying goods, transporting goods up from Baghdad, up the Euphrates or the Tigris, was very difficult and labour intensive. And basically, it could be done for luxury travel high, and high prestige projects, but it couldn't be done for the everyday supply. As you understand it, then the goods that rec- that um, allow Baghdad to exist as a as a large city, which I understand it was in the medieval period, um, came partly um, from uh, from downstream from the Gulf, yes, and partly f- from upstream from the agricultural areas. The ideas about the numbers of the population of Baghdad in let's say the ninth century, at its heyday and its, its times of its biggest expansion. Are, are very varied, but we can be reasonably certain that the population of the city was between a quarter of a million and a half a million. It might have been a bit more, but it's unlikely to have been less than a quarter of a million. And all these people could aspire to have one meal a day, uh, shall we say. Now, the area around Baghdad itself can be made quite fertile and so on, but it's not nearly enough productive enough to support a city in a population of that size. So. The, as it were, the market gravity of, of Baghdad has to attract supplies from north and south. And the uh, Jazeera area of what is now northern Iraq and Syria uh, was a made, could be a major source of grain if properly, edu- uh, properly irrigated and managed. And uh, the southern areas from the Gulf t- uh, to uh, the Gulf north to Baghdad was an area that was productive of above all of dates, which are a very important part of the staple, but also of fish and things like that. So the water supply was essential for the uh, feeding of the city uh, in the sense that without being able to transport goods by water, the city could never have achieved the, 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 the size that it did. And the, the transport systems were very different in the sense that what seems to have happened in the Jazeera is, uh, is interestingly very much the same as is described by Herodotus. The idea that grain is transported from the fields and irrigated areas of the Jazeera down the two great rivers on essentially rafts, very shallow draft craft of one sort or another, which are made from the wood of the forests of the Taurus Mountains, what is now southern Turkey. And they're put together and they're loaded up uh, in along the Euphrates Valley, particularly along the course of the Euphrates, particularly. This is one reason why Raqqa is so important, is not just because it's a military base for the Abbasids and you know, all those things that were told the whole time, but because it, it is a central port for the uh, grain supply of the, of the middle Euphrates and the Kabul River and, and so on and so forth. It is then floated down to Baghdad on these rafts, uh, where not only is the grain sold, but the rafts themselves are broken up and sold for timber, for building houses and things like that and so on. And then the people who brought them down just get on a donkey and go back up again and go back up the river again. So it's a, it's a gravity flow situation that is uh, it's attested from very ancient times and is... Um, seems to be in operating in the Abbasid period. So they didn't row or paddle back up the river. No. Is that an issue of the the amount of water or the the um, intensity of the flow? Why it was it was was it not not at all navigable in the other direction, or it was just easier not to? No, it could be. I think for uh, as it were luxury transport, elite transport, and so on. But as a way of feeding a large population, it was impractical, just because the current is so strong. That's very interesting. And the fact that the use of the timber, I'm, I'm, I love hearing stories of thrifty medieval people <laughs> and finding good ways of doing this. And of course, this is an area where there isn't a, a whole lot of um, forest or trees. Or that sort of it. They have a lot of rushes and things like that. Yeah. But the timber itself is an important secondary product. And, and this is why the canals that leak the Euphrates to the Tigris are so important, because it means you don't have to offload uh, the, the 
the rafts and so on until you actually get to Baghdad because you float them on these tributary canals. And when these canals appeared in Sasanian times, or at least some of them, the, the network seems to have been increased in earlier Basa period. But there comes a time when they stop being used. And I think it may be as early as the 10th century and the various crises. It's a symptom and a cause of the various crises of, of, of uh, food supply and so on that afflict Baghdad during the, during the course of the, the 10th and, and, and early 11th century. Yeah. So the water supply, when it's turned off in the sense that the canals seem to have silted up, they're not talked about anymore and so on, that is a major blow to the city in terms of the population and so on. Yeah, and so, that's, so it sounds like, um, well, one of the reasons Baghdad is a successful city and able to sustain such large population figures is because it's situated in a very rich, um, it has a very rich agricultural hinterland, um, mainly upstream we're talking about, that the, and then that grain can be floated down to feed the city. But you've also alluded to the fact that maybe this is not enough, that there's the, the Gulf, the existence of the Gulf and ports on the Gulf are another way of getting food to the city. Is that right? Uh, yes, but it's really from the areas of the of the marshes of southern Iraq, from Basra and so on, that, and also from, I think, from the area of Khuzestan as well, across the modern Iranian frontier of that, uh, that you, you get particularly dates, as I say, dates and fish and so on, are an important part of the diet. So it, it is, Baghdad is so successful partly because it's the intersection of two water systems, and two agricultural systems, the date system to the south, the grain system to the north. And um, and then, of course, animal products and so on, but they, they don't really, uh, they're not really connected with the water in quite the same sort of way, as far as I can make out. So that's why, that's why water and water transport is absolutely essential for the flourishing of the cities, of the city. And um, when travellers, one of the important sources of information about how all the system worked is, is 19th century travellers, particularly was a, a, a British project to try to uh, run ships from, the, well, essentially from the bend of the Euphrates near the Mediterranean down to the Gulf and obviously to India, blah, 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 but beyond that. Um, and they found it very difficult. I mean, the, the currents were too fast, the, the shoals were too uh, shallow, and there was nowhere the canals were, were that had uh, led from the Tigris, from the Euphrates to the Tigris were blocked up or had silted up. And so you had to unload everything at uh, Fallujah or somewhere up the Euphrates and take it by animal transport to Baghdad. Whereas in the Abbasid period, it seems that you didn't have to unload until you get to Baghdad. And so we see again the, the centrality of water flow and water supply to the feeding of the city. Thank you. I'd like to turn to Josephine now. And Hugh's already alluded a, a bit uh, to the canals that um, feed the city itself. Um, could you um, tell me a little bit more about how the citizens of Baghdad got their water and, and now turning more particularly to drinking water? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, these canals that run through the city, um, the one on the west bank, um, as you already mentioned, um, come from the Euphrates, um, not from the Tigris. For the most part, there's a few exceptions. Um, and especially for the early Abbasid period, it's those canals that are really emphasized in the sources as being very important for drinking water. Um, so we have this, um, the geographer and historian Al Yakubi who describes that for the people of Kar, so that's that neighborhood that the markets move to, so that is to the southwest mostly of the round city, that the water that they use comes from um, the Nahr Dajaj, um, from uh, the Nahr Tabiq. Uh, so it's all these, these canals that really sort of provide them with drinking water. He mentioned that there's also cisterns, but those cisterns again are fed by those canals. And that is what the people drink. Um, he also actually emphasizes that these canals were really necessary because the town, the city was so big. Um, 
So those canals are incredibly important. But as Hughes also already said, at some point, those canals um, are probably not well maintained. They fall into disuse and it becomes a problem. And we see this in the 10th, 11th century authors who write like, OK, so we had all these very nice canals, but at the time of writing, unfortunately, they've all dried up. Uh, most of them have disappeared. Um, and then they sometimes give us some hints as to where people then get their water from. And uh, there's a very nice quote in um, that explains that at that point, um, they either had to drink, especially the poor people, the richer people probably had some way of getting water to them um, by other means. Um, but the poor people had to either drink um, the water from the wells, which was rather brackish, not very good for drinking, or they'd have to go all the way to the Tigris to go and fetch some water there. Um, so that, that is what happens when those canals kind of fall into disuse. But there are other ways for people to get to water. There are some cisterns, although um, those are often reliant on those canals. So when the canals um, fall into disuse, the cisterns also become a bit problematic. But there is also, um, those are actually quite hard to find in the sources, but they're there and they play an important role. That's the water carriers who will go to the Tigris, um, load up their water skins, put them onto their donkeys or other um, other animals to carry them and take them into the city. And that is actually a really important way of water getting to um, the citizens of Baghdad as well. Um, and then lastly, um, for the round city specifically, but that is perhaps not so much citizens as actually the courts, there are some um, conduits constructed that take water directly um, into the round city. Um, so yeah, those are the different ways, really, that people get most of their drinking waters. So from what, you, what you're saying, um, one begins to get a sense of a social geography uh, that where there's certain hierarchies of um, uh, wealth that determine what, uh, how you get your water. Is, is that right to say? Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So what you see is that the, the really rich, um, if they have large feasts, will even dig their own canals to provide water to their own, um, their own fee for their, for their own use, whether that is nice gardens, but also um, sometimes even having canals dug into palaces where people then keep fish. Um, so it's, if you're really rich, you can have your own private canal, so to say. Um, the rich are definitely not going to the Tigris by themselves to go and fetch their water. Um, if they don't have other ways of getting water into, um, into their houses um, by these canals, for instance, um, they're going to have water carriers do it for them. Um, so, yeah, and, and for the poor, especially when um, the canal system breaks down, um, that is much harder and they have to, yeah, they're torn between either drinking brackish water and not having to take hours out of their day every day to go and fetch water from the Tigris or doing the latter and have drinkable water. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely social differences between, uh, between people in the ways of how they get their water and what the quality of that water would be. And I suppose also you mentioned these cisterns. I guess some people have their own, can build their own private cisterns in their houses and um, that that sort of level of domestic uh, provision is is variable. Um, Absolutely, um, not everyone will have space for a cistern. Not everyone will have the means to um, have one constructed. Um, yeah, up there is there's loads of differences in the, in that regard. Absolutely. Yes, Hugh. It looks like you have something to add to that. Yes, I think that the importance of the river to Baghdad was also connected with transport within the city. Elite people preferred to go by boat. It was more comfortable, it was less dusty, it was less dirty, there was less chance of being attacked in general. And the richest people in Baghdad had houses which had gardens that went down to the water, like the Khuld Palace, which was between the Round City and the Tigris, where the early Abbasid Caliphs were one of the places where they chose to uh, live. And so if you wanted to go somewhere, you went down to the bottom of your garden, as it were, and there was the boatman there, the malah, 
we, we hear about the sailors there would pick you up and and take you to where you wanted to go and so it was conducive to elite transport and uh, the sorts of boats that we have are, are very difficult to reconstruct we have lots of names of sorts of boats they none of them seem to be reflected in the modern nomenclature of, of boats we know that some boats like the Haraka seem to be posh boats and they seem to be they glide across the water then there are other sorts of boats which seem to be more called cargo boats and so on but because we don't have any visual images of boats during this period it's difficult to know what's going on and <clears throat> curiously we know much more about the sort of boats that the Assyrian rulers of the um, uh, 7th and 8th century BC used than we do about the, the boats that the Abbasids used because the, the, the Assyrian ones come on the great that's reliefs and so on. So you've got water, luxury water transport uh, is an important thing. And I came across a reference in a series of anecdotes about Baghdad um, saint, if you like, Maruf Kahi, or other search for the minded, and describing how along the sandy banks of the Tigris, uh, boatmen would anchor and they'd call out just like people did in, as it were, service taxis in Beirut or something. And they would say, I'm going to a little place upstream or downstream. Who wants to come along? People come down and get in the boat and, and pay him. And so on. so uh, water taxi service is portrayed as being quite a, an, an active thing there. And um, so water transport within the city, different classes of people using different sorts of boats. Uh, the and boats used for for bridges over the river too there were no uh there were no masonry or, or, or concrete bridges over the tigris in baghdad till the 20th century all the bridges were bridges of boats tied or chained together and so on and sometimes these were quite difficult to navigate there's a description from the early 10th century of a uh, a woman from the court a very powerful woman from the court who was drowned because she was going along in her boat the wind caught the sails of the boat it was washed it under the bridge the boat capsized because the mast caught on the bridge and she was drowned and this is one of those anecdotes that you you're really dependent on for just getting a, an idea about everyday life of boats and boat people in, in, in Baghdad so you've got the massive use of water transport to feed the city but within the city again the water transport is, is very important, especially for elites. Fascinating. Well, um, while we're talking about elites, I'd like to pivot a bit and talk about who was responsible for all of this, for, for, for the, these, this infrastructure that allowed water supply to be um, used both for drinking and for transport. Uh, we've mentioned a bit of uh, quite a lot about elites, but we haven't so far mentioned that much about um, rulers, except right at the beginning when we talked about Mansur founding the city. Uh, to what extent were rulers instrumental in managing water in and around Baghdad or not? Or to what extent were there other actors involved, so wealthy private individuals or, or local communities uh, who managed this stuff? Um, Josephine. Have you got uh, thoughts about that? Yes, so um, the ruler um, for early Abbasid Baghdad, that is the caliph, was definitely involved um, in this to some level. The, the, the level to which he's involved differs a bit, it would appear. So there is definitely a sort of general idea that he, the state, if we can call it that, is somehow responsible for these things. So you have some manuals from this period for. Um, sometimes for Hizba, so that's kind of the, for the Muhtasib, so kind of the, um, the manager of the, of the city markets, but he's also responsible for other things. Um, and those manuals, we don't really have one for Abbasid Baghdad, but we have some that are more or less um, contemporaneous from other places within the same general region. Um, and they do say some things about water. They will say things like, oh, um, fullers and dyers may not pour wastewater into the canals because obviously that would pollute them. And also things about damages to, um, to roads or mosques or bridges that need to be fixed. Um, and that those, um, 
the, the responsibility for that quite clearly lies with the ruler. Um, but there is all sort of a, a caveat, like, but only if there's enough money in the treasury. Um, so it appears that there's a general line of thinking that there is some kind of responsibility there that applies to sort of general infrastructure. That is also something that you see in um, a sort of more ideas about how to go about founding a city, where there's a list of things that people need to look out for. Um, and those can also be like to not mix neighborhoods of people that don't like each other, um, different groups with conflicting interests. But it also says things like the first thing you need to do is make sure that there is, or maybe not the first one, but one of the most important things that you need to do is make sure that there is water. Um, and if there isn't water, to provide it to make sure there is a canal of sorts. So there's definitely some kind of notion that the ruler is responsible. And that is sometimes something that you also find in those anecdotes. As Hugh just pointed out, um, you're really reliant on anecdotes sometimes. Um, so for Baghdad, for one, there is little to no archaeological evidence that we have. And we have these primary sources that are incredibly interesting, but not necessarily set down to write down for us historians of the future how people run their city. So we're sort of really digging into like, oh, we have this tiny anecdote and we have this and we're trying to sort of create a bigger picture out of that. But sometimes these anecdotes do show us some interesting things. Um, so for instance, there is at some point to the caliph, um, the question of the people from Tashkent, um, Shash um, at the time, but present day Tashkent, who ask the caliph um, for quite a lot of money to um, dig out their canal that has apparently silted up. And the caliph initially says something along the lines of, oh, they're very far away. Why is that any of my concern? Um, and then one of his advisors reminds him that even the people in Shash, even though they are very far away, are in fact still his subjects. And so he is responsible. And the anecdote doesn't say whether he pays up or not, but I think he does. So there is some kind of notion that the caliph is responsible or the ruler is responsible. At the same time, however, there is a lot of other initiative. There, um, you can see a sort of charitable activity by elites. Um, I've already referred to the important role of water carriers who are next to invisible in the sources. They are um, they're really of a lower social class. So they only really show up in anecdotes as well. Um, in anecdotes, for instance, when they're um, when their donkeys are used to display people um, who have been um, put through corporal punishment and they're now being shamed on the backs of the water carrier's donkeys. That's kind of when you see the water carriers show up. Um, but they must have played a very important role. What you also see when it comes to um, the involvement of the caliph in water management is that quite frequently he is involved and sometimes also in fairly big projects. Um, but the primary beneficiary of those projects is also very often the caliph himself and his courts and immediate surroundings. So, yes, he plays an important role, but definitely not an exclusive one. And also some of the roles he plays are really, it's really quite self-serving at times. Hugh, I, I can see you nodding when, when Josephine is saying that these uh, projects are, benefit the caliph. Yes, and uh, that the, there's an interesting discussion about the provision of water by the Sultan, in the sense of the government, uh, not from Baghdad, but from Basra, where water supply was a really big problem. And the citizens are asking the governor to dig a new canal. This is early Abbasid period, so the government, the governor is Suleiman ibn Ali. And the they're asking him to dig a canal from the uh, marshes, the water of the marshes, which was held to be good drinking water. People love the water of the Tigris, actually. There are all sorts of poems about how wonderful it is and so on. It may look disgusting and dirty to us, but it didn't to them. Anyway, they, the, the water from the marshes, which was fresh, sweet water, to bring it to Baghdad. And they hold that this is the responsibility, or they argue this is the responsibility of the governor. And the governor in the end uh, agrees to do that. And they bring along two uh, glass bottles, they must be glass, bottles of water, one from the brackish water that you've got in the neighborhood of Basra, another of the clear sweet water from the uh, uh, 
uh, from the marshes and they say look at these two different sorts of waters we want to and it is accepted that it's the purpose of the government to uh, provide water for drinking or they are arguing that it is um, and we we'll also get from Basra evidence about what Josephine's been talking about about uh, elite people constructing systems where basically the sediment goes down the bottom the water is still the sediment goes down to the bottom so there is drinking water for themselves and for other people as a sort of charitable what almost a, a, a charitable thing that, that's going on there so something that interests me and i'll just, I'll just, I'll just finish up quickly it's who provides water for ablution in mosques because this is a sort of fundamental societal obligation that you in that you, you, you can conduct your ablutions. Who is responsible for this and how it works? And I've never found any information about this anywhere, but it's a thing. Well, I, I don't know about uh, medieval Baghdad, but Ibn Asaka's description of, uh, of the water in and around Damascus mentions that Al-Walid, when he builds the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, he pays for a canal to be built uh, that brings water to the Umayyad Mosque and also, well, a canal, a channel. And not only that, but he pays for the water rights too. So he, he, he acknowledges that if he's taking some water out of the general system, then other people will be the poorer for it. And so he, he pays for that water to be presume and presumably that's drinking water and ablution water. But um, Josephine, you, you look like you have something to add to this. Yeah, so with regards to the water provision, that is also something that I've, um, the water provision in mosques, I mean, that is also something that I've looked at and haven't found a whole lot for it either. Some of the um, travel accounts, especially of the um, 12th, 13th century, will say something about the presence of water facilities at mosques, but it's quite unclear who is responsible for the upkeep of them. Um, but I, for um, Baghdad, um, El Mahdi, the son of El Mansur, so the founder of the city of Baghdad, um, he sort of settles on the east bank of the river in a place called Rusafa. And there is actually a canal there, the uh, Nahr al Mahdi, so the Mahdi can, El Mahdi Canal, named after him, um, that actually continues all the way into the congregational mosque. Um, and the sources are quite explicit in that that is there then used by worshippers. So, Apparently, um, in some cases, Rood is did quite actively involve there, um, get involved there as well. Um, but yeah, I also wanted to hark back a little bit about um, what you said about these charitable systems, because um, I think some uh, some very early um, charitable foundations, wakfs, um, they're called, actually are in Baghdad. We have um, that there's this very long relationship between um, water and charity in Islam. Um, there's even a, um, a hadith, um, a, a tradition in which the Prophet is uh, said to have said that um, the best way of doing charity is actually um, providing water. Um, so water and charity are really closely connected in the Islamic tradition. Um, and that takes a massive flight in, in later times. Um, Mamluk Egypt, for instance, in Cairo, um, is an excellent example of this, where there are loads of um, public fountains called sabils, where people would get like a cup of water. Um, if you ever visit Cairo and you walk through what is now known as Islamic Cairo, um, the city is littered with them. There are so many. You can recognize them by the, uh, the metal um, rasters in front of them. Um, and there are these, um, these symbols of, of charity, but also of power of the people who constructed them and who are thereby taking a very sort of active role in city life and showing that they are part of the community, but also leading that community. And these things are much harder to see for Baghdad, again, also because we don't have that kind of architecture that we can look at and we have fewer sources, but you do see them. And I think two really good examples for that are um, the so-called Birka Zalzal or the Pool of Zalzal, which is on the West Bank, and the Tank of Hailana or the Haut Hailana on the East Bank of the city. Um, and these are actually very early foundations. They are very early for this concept 
of a religious foundation of one of those rocks that's providing water. They're very early examples. So this Zaza was a um, lute player, actually, in the courts of various caliphs, but especially the famous caliph Harun al-Rashid, um, who people might know from A Thousand and One Nights or Arabian Nights. Um, and that um, pool was pretty dark sometime in the seven, yeah, between the 780s and, and the very early um, 800s, 803 or something. Um, and he was a very famous lute player at that cause and apparently at some point quite rich. And he had this pool dog to provide people with water. The sources are quite explicit in saying that it is a waqf for the Muslims, uh, for the people to have water. Um, and more or less the same applies to this Hailana. So the problem there is that even our earliest sources, so for instance, a geographer like um, Ibn al-Faqi, um, who's writing around the year 900, um, he even isn't exactly sure which Haylana this is. There are two options. There is one who was a stewardess of the Caliph al-Mansur, so Baghdad's founder, um, or she might have been an enslaved woman in the harem of Harun al-Rashid. So not exactly sure who the Haylana was who endowed this, uh, this tank, this water tank. So that one was constructed somewhere between the 770s and 790, probably. Um, and there again, yeah, so it's, these people are members of the elites. They're not exactly the, ruling, the rulers themselves. They don't have that power by themselves, but they do belong to these ruling circles. And by making these, these very watery waqfs, these religious foundations, um, they demonstrate their piety, but they also enhance their status in society. And very important um, for the locals, they help provide water to the city. Thank you. Um, so we've looked then at the state and the role of the state to provide water as part of its uh, projection of legitimacy, I suppose, and the, the idea of it being a good government. We've looked at charitable reasons. You've also slightly alluded to profit motives. Uh, can you pick up a little more on that? Um, maybe, Hugh, have you got something to say to that? To what extent, if you're building a canal that runs into or close by a city, to what extent is that because you're uh, making the investment and you expect to get some return on it? It depends what you're using the water for. Uh, that there is at least some provision in Muslim law for the idea that flowing water is public property. You cannot charge for naturally flowing water. Though, of course, that need not necessarily always be the case. Um, but the, what we hear about, of course, are people investing in water for irrigation and paying for new irrigation ditches and new irrigation trenches to be dug or old ones to be maintained. And in that case, the profit motive is, is, is absolutely clear that this is an investment and you expect to get money back from bringing water to dead lands and so on. And you expect to acquire the ownership of those lands if you bring water to previously uncultivated lands and so on. So at that level, water is, is clear. Investing in water supply is a, a big deal financially. But I think for drinking water, at least openly, this is not the case. But I may be wrong here, and there may be examples of people, but it would go against the general trend in Islamic law, I think, that, that sees flowing water as a public good that you can't charge money. Josephine, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, when I said um, that the caliph is bringing in water mostly for his own um, for his own purposes, I didn't really mean drinking water indeed in the sense of there being a sort of financial profit from it. Um, because as Hugh says, indeed, um, yeah, there, that, that's not really something that you can sell to that extent. Although I have come across some very interesting mentions, come to think of it, um, for I think the 12th or 13th century, that um, for ablutions in the mosques of Iraq, people had to pay. Um, it's in one of the travel accounts. Um, but anyhow, um, what I meant to say was more... Um, Various caliphs have um, fairly big building projects. There's, of course, Al-Mansur, who um, constructs Baghdad, but then there's also later caliphs um, who go and construct Samarra and places around Samarra. And part of that is almost always developing a massive waterway because you need one. You need one in order to be able to build a city. Um, 
It's needed for not only drink, drinking for the workers, but you also need it to make bricks. Um, so you need, you literally need water in order to build the city. So very often that is the first thing that happens. Um, but what you also see is that the caliph, um, at least in, um, in Baghdad, will construct water conduits that appear to primarily serve him and his court and not so much the areas um, around it, not so much the citizens. Um, based on this, the written sources, it's not always easy to say whether these conduits also serve the citizens, but I don't think that they do. So what you see in Baghdad is that at the very beginning, as I said, there's a construction of water sources. So um, there are wells being dug and there is a um, what the authors call a qanat, um, but we shouldn't really think of the typically Iranian structure that runs from a mountain um, water source into a city. Um, it's more of just an underground conduit in this, um, in this context. And that water comes from um, the Karhaya Canal and it runs into the round city. It's hard to say whether that, I mean, that probably provides water to people within the round city as well. But I don't think it provides water to the outlying area such as Karh, even though it technically runs through there. And then at some point, usually um, based on this reading of a specific source text um, by someone called Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, um, historians tend to imagine that there is two of those, one coming in from the Karhaya Canal and the other one coming in from the Tigris or the Tigris or a tributary thereof. Um, but I don't think that is quite the case. I think there's one of those coming into uh, the city from the Karhaya Canal. And then the other one is a teak wood conduit that comes in, um, that's built slightly later, that comes in from the Tigris, that has a water wheel, because as Hugh said previously, um, the Tigris is lower than the Euphrates. So in order to get um, Tigris water flowing into um, the, the west bank of the city, you have to lift the water first. So a water wheel is constructed, and teak wood conduits are constructed, and those run from the um, eastern gate to directly to the palace and there's some different there's different stories that are told to explain why um, why that is constructed um, one says that the caliph is absolutely abhorred when he learns that there's actually donkeys for the of the water carriers coming into his court and um, the other one is that um, an ambassador whether Byzantine or for somewhere else um, criticizes the lack of running water in the city and then the caliph goes like oh but our water is fine but then still has this teak wood conduit built so the story that sort of is behind it differs so it's hard to say what exactly happens there but what you do see is that this is a conduit that appears to be quite explicitly built at probably rather high cost um, teak wood wasn't cheap um, labor also um, was cheaper than the teak wood probably, um, but it would still have been a massive, massive project. So that was an expensive project and the water really just ran to the palace. Thank you. Well, we should wrap up soon. I just have a couple more questions. The first is we've been talking mainly about the benefits of water. Uh, what about the pitfalls, the liabilities, the dangers that uh, come with having a this complex and varied uh, system of water supply in the city. Were there any downsides to any of this? I mean, it's always a vulnerable thing, the water supply. Um, throughout history, that is always something that's been targeted by um, advancing armies and during sieges. And that is definitely something that happens here as well. There is a civil war between two brothers, al Ma'mun and Al-Amin, um, about, the, about the caliphate. And Al-Amin at some point is besieged in the round city and he has no fresh water to drink. Um, the fresh water is all gone. He can only drink um, from the well at the guard's post, um, which is very brackish water. Um, and it's, it's so disgusting that he doesn't drink it, um, which actually does raise the question of what happened to that teak wood conduit and that Karhaya canal, because at least a teak wood conduit, according to the sources, should still be running for a few decades after, because this happens in 813. 
and that conduit only falls out of use according to the sources around 860. So presumably it was blocked by these troops. Um, and El Amin really suffers from that. So, I mean, it's always um, a potential weakness um, during sieges. Um, and also, of course, something that people could um, use to uh, fight in other ways. You can block things, but you can also poison it. And I don't have any specific examples for that for Baghdad, but during the um, activity spider carmations in the Arabian Peninsula, um, they would poison water sources by throwing in corpses of animal and people um, into these cisterns or other um, places where people would get drinking water, which, of course, was especially effective seeing it was um, a desert. So there's only a few places that you can get water. And once those places are, are poisoned in this manner, um, that becomes immediately a very pressing problem. Thank you both very much for this really uh, fascinating conversation. I'd just like to ask one uh, final question um, about the sort of the purpose of history and, and what, what, what we can learn from this as modern people now, you know, living in a time of environmental crisis and water shortage in many places. Um, is there anything we can take from uh, pre-modern, what, what we see here, these kinds of situations, what can we learn from pre-modern water management? Um, uh, Hugh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, the moral of it all is that water management of the sort that was going on in Baghdad and so on requires constant care and management and investment uh, that um, even a, a couple of decades can see, or less than that even, can see the silting up of these, these sort of things. It requires care. But of course, so much has changed in 20th century technology with uh, mechanical pumping, and with concrete lining of irrigation trenches, uh, irrigation ditches and so on, that has really in a way transformed the way that people did these things because they had, um, in Abbasid times they had no, except for very sort of shaduf type um, water wheels and so on, they had no method of raising water. It had to be done by gravity. So you have, um, uh, whereas nowadays, of course, the people are using pumps to extract water from much deeper with, in the end, catastrophic long-term consequences because the aquifers are not being replenished and so on. So, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, uh, modern technologies are, to say the least, a, a mixed blessing when it comes to water management. Yeah. Um, Josephine, do you have a, a final word to say on, on this or any other uh, topic we've been covering? Yes, I think... Also something to take away from, um, especially reading, maybe not so much the management in itself, but the way that people write about it is a sort of understanding of how precious a commodity water is. Um, because that is something that the people writing in these days are very aware of because they are seeing, I think, much more um, than um, the average inhabitant of the global north is. They're very aware of the um, difficulty that goes into um, getting the water to the city, how much of an effort that costs and how much of, of a financial financially that also might cost. And I think that that is something um, of the, the preciousness of this commodity that um, many people have lost sight of a little bit. That is still very present in these primary sources that, that I'm reading. Um, and I think that um, yeah, that is a mentality that um, we could use a little bit more of, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we can wrap up now. It's been a really fascinating conversation. And so I'd just like to, again, thank our guests, Josephine Fenden bent and Hugh Kennedy, for a really wonderful and interesting session. Thank Thanks you. very much. It was really enjoyable Most indeed. Enjoyable. And that's all from us now. Thank you for listening.